So, okay, welcome to this week's uh, Holotube talk by Koichi Hashimoto from Kyoto University. And um, he will tell us about machine learning the bulk in ADS-CFT. So we are looking forward to uh, your talk. Uh, the stage is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, I'm Koji from uh, Kyoto University. Uh, here it's uh, midnight, so my brain may be slow, but uh, you can ask many questions to uh, excite me. So please stop me anytime when you have a question. So uh, my, my talk today is about uh, machine learning the bulk in the setup of ADS CFT correspondence. This talk is based on uh, many papers uh, written with my colleagues. And the reason one uh, is uh, in the first line here, it's uh, about deriving the electron potential in improved holography from chiral condensate using machine learning. So uh, here's a list of my collaborators. And uh, before I start uh, starting my talk, uh, this talk is uh, uh, a bit of use of uh, machine learning technique, uh, deep learning. And you may uh, wonder how, how and why deep learning may help uh, holography. And uh, so I, I'd like to uh, tell you my story about uh, how we can use machine learning for understanding ADS safety and uh, for QC physics. So in Japan, uh, we also started a kind of a new uh, uh, Japan government uh, grounded uh, initiative uh, that is called Foundation of Machine Learning Physics in Japan. And uh, we have uh, like a 70, uh, theory researchers in physics to get together to use uh, machine learning for physics. And we have uh, international conferences. So uh, if you are interested in uh, this kind of thing and uh, also interested in coming to Japan, uh, please look at uh, this kind of web page of ours. So anyway, uh, this is uh, my uh, content today. So first, uh, let me explain why uh, I use deep learning to uh, ADS CFT and how I use it. So of course, I will uh, briefly tell you uh, how uh, machine learning works. And you'll find the similarity between ADS CFT correspondence and machine learning itself. So I'd like to use this uh, similarity to implement machine learning to ADS CFT and use it. And in section two, uh, in fact, uh, we can find a holographic space time emergent from the data, which is uh, QCD lattice data. So uh, as you know, uh, we uh, hope for uh, finding a nice holographic model, uh, which uh, reproduces uh, QCD data, for example. And to find such a model is very difficult. So I'd like to make uh, use of machine learning as a help to find a good uh, holographic model for us. So it's a section two. And using this uh, emergent space time, which is uh, obtained from machine learning uh, with the QCD data, uh, in section three, I, I, uh, I will uh, construct the gravity action itself. So this completes the program of finding a nice uh, gravity model uh, out of QCD data by using machine learning. So let me start with uh, section one, uh, why and how. So on your left, uh, we have the standard uh, kind of cartoon for ADS CFT correspondence. Uh, I have classical gravity theory in D plus one dimensional space time. And at the bottom, you have quantum field theory in D dimensional space time. So at the strong coupling limit and large, uh, large end limit, uh, these are supposed to be equal in uh, holography. So based on this uh, general belief, uh, we try to build a nice uh, gravity theory which corresponds to QCD. For example, the conventional modeling uh, is as follows. So you have uh, your target uh, quantum field theory, uh, which could be QCD or any cohort suit by mills, or blah, blah, blah. And from that, uh, you have, for example, experimental data for the case of QCD or lattice data. So uh, QCD action or quantum field theory action is given, then you got uh, these data. On the other hand, uh, for the conventional modeling, uh, you need to prepare a gravity model, 
gravity model means a gravity action. So it's an Einstein Hilbert plus maybe cosmological constant plus some matter sectors and some interactions. So it has a lot of parameters. But uh, anyway, you need to prepare some uh, nice gravity action. Then from the action, you solve the equation of motion, that is Einstein's equation. Then you get metric. And on this uh, solution metric, uh, for example, you do some perturbations of matter fields. And then you get uh, some predictions, which correspond to these uh, lattice data by the ADSFT dictionary. So you compare these things. And if this comparison goes well, then you say that this gravity model is good one. But if this comparison doesn't work, then you say that this gravity model is bad one and you throw it away. So this is a kind of cycle which you, we followed many, many times uh, to find a good gravity model. But as you see, this is uh, quite insufficient, uh, in inefficient, right? You need to try gravity model once again and again and again. And you need to be clever to find a nice gravity model. So I gave up. So rather than using this conventional model again, uh, I use bulk reconstruction. So what is bulk reconstruction? So starting point is the same. So we have a target quantum field theory uh, from which we can, uh, ex, uh, ex, uh, we, can, we can get some experimental data or a lattice data. Then uh, we suppose the existence of a gravity model, but we don't uh, actually assume any action here. First, uh, what you need to do is reconstruction of the bulk geometry from this data. Then you get some metric, okay? So here, of course, we need to assume the dictionary of ADS-CFT. But um, in this dictionary, of course, uh, usually gravity metric is uh, given and then you compute blah, blah, blah. But uh, if we can do backwards, then this lattice or experimental data actually can fix the metric itself. Once the metric is uh, obtained, then uh, you get action, right? The reason is quite simple. Uh, this action is reconstructed so that this given metric is a solution of it. Okay, then you get an action. So once you get an Einstein plus uh, matter field action, then you are free to uh, solve anything, right? So since this is a system, so since system is given, for example, uh, using this metric or other metric as a solution of this uh, equation of motion of the action, you have some other predictions, and then you compare that with other lattice data, other observables. And this is uh, supposed to work well, since uh, this uh, metric itself was reconstructed from one kind of data. So uh, if this holography works quite nicely, then the, uh, the whole picture uh, should work well. So the prediction should work well. So this is about reconstruction technique. The difficulty here uh, actually uh, resides in this uh, red arrow going upwards. So this part is uh, a kind of solving uh, inverse problem. So it's difficult. So there are many, uh, in fact, uh, uh, reconstruction method uh, which have been invented by many people. And this is a partial list of it. For example, for uh, holographic renormalization, uh, you can use entanglement or complexity. You can use uh, correlators. And depending on uh, what kind of observables you use, in fact, the ads safety dictionaries are different. For entanglement, you need a uh, Liu Takai Nagi surface. For correlators, you have uh, a written propagator in the bulk. And holographic renormalization, you have uh, uh, Einstein equation. So, in this way, uh, depending on what kind of uh, uh, data you want to use, uh, reconstruction method are different. So some are good at some, for some purpose, some are bad at for some, some purpose. For example, if you uh, like to use uh, lattice data, then uh, entanglement uh, is not good since uh, obtaining entanglement in lattice is very difficult. 
now and, and also real time correlator here and also uh if you uh, don't want to assume the Einstein's equation, then you cannot use holographic renormalization since uh, this uh, method uses Einstein equation. So in this way, uh, there are many uh, uh, good, good parts and bad parts. And uh, in this talk, I'd like to uh, use uh, this ADS deep learning correspondence, which I proposed uh, five years ago uh, with these people. So this ADS uh, deep learning correspondence started uh, with this uh, kind of similarity. On the uh, left-hand side, you have a wormhole in Penrose diagram. And on your right-hand side, uh, this is an architecture of the deep auto encoder. So these uh, look quite similar to each other in many aspects. And ADS deep learning correspondence actually uh, deepens this kind of similarity uh, to the level of uh, uh, science, I would say. So how are these two pictures uh, can actually look uh, similar to each other? So uh, to find that, uh, I'd like to tell you a little bit about the history of the use of machine learning uh, in uh, science. So here on your uh, left-hand side, uh, we have this uh, ADA safety correspondence. It's a correspondence between gravity and lower dimensional quantum field theory. And here is an uh, aligned spins, for example. Uh, this is the higher dimensional uh, space time. The ADS safety means that these two are equal. And uh, it started with the simple example of CFT. And in fact, uh, for CFT, we have a very nice correspondence between these two. Uh, by means of tensor network. The tensor network uh, is a connection of the, these uh, spin degrees of freedom. And if we extend the tensor to uh, deeper into, say, bulk, then it is a network of uh, one dimensional higher. And Swing will actually notice that uh, this uh, tensor network uh, for conformal fixed point uh, quite looks like uh, the under the space time. And in fact, uh, if you divide the anti the space time into the unit uh, uh, volume cell, then, uh, at, and suppose that at each cell uh, you have a tensor, then uh, this area space time look like a, the tensor network. And in fact, uh, 2017, Carly and Troya generalized this tensor network approach to find out the ground state wave function for a given uh, spin system to a neural network. So tensor network uh, can be understood as a kind of a neural network. So this is a generalization. And now uh, we, you have a generalized network which represents the ground, ground state of a quantum mechanical uh, system. So the question is, okay, uh, this is generalization of tensor network and tensor network corresponded to uh, ADS space time. So this neural network could correspond to a general space time. So this is the uh, big view of uh, why neural network uh, may work in the holographic setup. So uh, in the following sections, I'd like to uh, uh, detail uh, this cor correspondence uh, so that uh, it should work uh, for our purpose. And uh, I need the technical detail about the machine learning. So here is a one uh, page summary of uh, uh, the machine learning. So it's, uh, uh, so oh, of course I have a heavy uh, use of a uh, computer, but uh, I don't uh, explain the details. So here is uh, the, a brief explanation of uh, how machine learning works. So first uh, we prepare a neural network and uh, what I use is a so-called feed-forward neural network. So feed-forward neural network uh, consists of uh, these uh, circles, which are called units, and lines, those uh, which are called uh, weights. And the information is put at these yellow uh, circles, and output is at uh, the right-hand side, which is uh, this red circle. So uh, for example, this is a, a very simple perceptron model. 
uh, in which the input is a two-dimensional vector and the output is one-dimensional vector. Okay. And this uh, 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 figure actually corresponds to uh, a certain function uh, of output f as a function of the input x. So in this case, xj consists of x1 and x2, so two-dimensional vector. And these lines, uh, which are a linear transformation, uh, which is two by two matrix W1. And then once this uh, two-dimensional vector is mapped to this green uh, two-dimensional vector, then for each component, you act a so-called uh, activation function, which is a nonlinear component-wise uh, transformation. This is an example activation function, which is often used in literature and other shapes uh, you can assume. And after this activation function, you actually multiply again this matrix. So in this case, two by one matrix, which is W2, and then you get the final output. And in this uh, neural network, the uh, matrix components, W2 and W1, the each elements are, are, are two noble parameters. So you change the parameters uh, in W2 and W1, then you change the functions. And by tuning these parameters, you can get a desired uh, function by this neural network. So uh, here is a training protocol of uh, machine learning. Uh, first, you prepare many sets of the correct set pairs of uh, uh, input and output. For example, if you want to train a machine which actually discriminates a cat's image from dog image, then you prepare many images of cats, many images of dog, and then for cats, you assign f is zero. For dog, you assign f is one, something like that. Then you prepare many, many sets, uh, many, many pairs, and form this uh, set, and this is called training data, uh, which consists of just a pair of input and output data. Then you train this network by adjusting the elements of W by lowering so-called uh, loss function. So what is loss function? Loss function is the distance between the correct output and the neural network output. You change these Ws, values of elements of these uh, matrices, then if this is uh, very finely tuned, then this uh, loss function becomes zero. If E is zero, then this means that the neural network output is equal to this uh, data output, uh, which is the correct data. So uh, this reproduces everything. So this is how machine learning works. Do you have any question? Okay. So let me use uh, this kind of technology, uh, which is behind all the AI uh, investment these days, to our uh, holographic program. So in section two, uh, space emergent from data. So let's consider this kind of uh, problem. This is one of the simplest holographic model. So let's consider a classical scalar field theory in unknown curved five-dimensional space-time. This is supposed to be dual to QCD, but we don't know uh, what is the background metric. We don't know uh, what is the uh, ADS radius. We don't know what is the coupling uh, of this uh, scalar field. So these are unknown parameters. Uh, what we know is the QCD data. So this phi is supposed to uh, correspond to the operator of chiral condensate, uh, which is uh, spin zero, parity even. And uh, this is the dictionary, okay? And then uh, let me prepare a data. Uh, data is a pair of coke mass and cube cube. Okay, you, you run your lattice uh, and then uh, depending on your, your coke uh, mass, uh, you get uh, coke condensate. So this is the data. And 
I want uh, to find f, g, l, and lambda, uh, which is suitable to reproduce uh, this uh, QCD data. So this is the bulk reconstruction. So how can I do that? So before I do that, let me uh, review uh, what is the ADCFT dictionary. So this is the dictionary. Uh, first, uh, we prepare a five-dimensional metric, uh, which has extra dimension eta. So f of eta and g of eta, these are unknown functions. But these need to uh, satisfy the following boundary conditions. First, at the ADS boundary, eta is infinite. F and G goes like a pure ADS metric, where L is the ADS radius. So this is a certain condition. And the other condition is the other side. At eta equals to zero, since this is a finite temperature, so there should exist a black hole horizon according to ADS CFD dictionary. And at the horizon, uh, F goes like eta squared, and G goes to positive non-zero constant. So this is the, uh, the no, uh, ordinary condition for the black hole horizon for this uh, gauge fixed uh, metric. So these are boundary conditions for F and G and our, uh, our metric, which uh, we find by using machine learning should satisfy these conditions. And under these conditions, uh, we have a dictionary of uh, about scalar field and core condensate. According to this uh, uh, old paper by Krebanov and Witten, we solve the equation of motion of this scalar field in this background to get this response function. So how can I get it? At the ADS boundary, uh, this equation of motion of the scalar field has two solutions. Since this uh, Q by Q has a uh, dimension three, uh, we have the fixed uh, mass in the bulk. So the uh, coefficient in front of uh, this normalizable mode is Q by Q. And this non-normalizable mode, uh, coke mass. So this is the dictionary. On the other hand, at the black hole horizon, you need to impose ingoing boundary condition for the horizon. And that for the static case of ours correspond to phi derivative is equal to zero at the horizon. So this, this is a dictionary and the consistency condition for the scalar field. So please keep these conditions in your mind and let's proceed. So the next step is to bring our scalar field equation motion to the form of neural network. The reason is as follows. So in the equation of motion of scalar field, there is a metric, of course, you have two metric components, f and g, and these are combined into a single uh, unknown function h, and appear, uh, that is appearing in this equation of motion here as a coefficient. And you want to find this h of beta. Okay. So first I discretize uh, this equation uh, along eta direction, like this. And then introduce the conjugate of phi, uh, which I call pi. Then you have the uh, discretized Hamilton equation that looks like these. And if you look at uh, this, these equations, in fact, uh, this allows an interpretation of the neural network. Uh, remember that in the neural network, you have the vector input, which is two dimensional. Then you multiply matrix and then nonlinear activation function and mat matrix and activation. And this is the layers of the neural network. So this set of equations uh, look the same. So you have the matrix mul multiplication pa uh, part and also nonlinear part here, right? And in this uh, multiplication of uh, uh, matrix, you have uh, this uh, uh, undetermined element, which is uh, like the usual neural network. W is undetermined yet. It will be optimized by using the data. So here the question is the same. H of beta, that, that is metric, 
is unknown. So we need to fix it by optimizing uh, by optimization using the data. So here, unknown part is uh, hidden. So if I draw the figure of the architecture of neural network, then it looks like this. So you have many, many layers along the ADA direction. You start with the ADS boundary. You have two uh, inputs, pi and pi. Then it propagates in the neural network. This uh, green, these green lines correspond to uh, this age of beta. It's a function of beta. So uh, these green lines uh, take different values at each layer. And then finally, you reach the uh, black hole horizon. And then uh, you just pick up pi. And pi needs to be equal to 0 if this is a consistent uh, solution, which is normalizable. Because this pi is, is equal to 0 is the boundary condition at the black hole horizon. So in this way, you can cast the question of finding a proper metric uh, for this scalar field equation of motion to the problem of uh, optimizing the weights in this uh, very special neural network. And as you can see, uh, this uh, correspondence is quite easily done. So uh, maybe you have uh, your own holographic question. And I think, uh, it is always the case that you can uh, cast your question into the form of neural network, the special neural network, and you can optimize it. So anyway, this is the dictionary. So let me use the data uh, to optimize this uh, neural network. So here is the data, uh, which I borrowed uh, from uh, Lattice QCD at, uh, say, temperature 207 MeV. The horizontal axis is the quark mass. The vertical axis is the core condensate. And these uh, uh, blue parts are the lattice data. And these orange dots are false data. So you need to uh, prepare uh, uh, true ones and false ones to train the neural network. The point is that uh, when you uh, put the true data, then the output uh, satisfies the black hole boundary condition. When you put the false data, then the output doesn't satisfy the black hole boundary equation. So in this way, you have uh, two kinds of data, uh, true data and false data. And this can, uh, with this, uh, you can train the neural network. Now let me show you how uh, this works. On your left-hand side, uh, we have the data. And on your right-hand side, we have the metric. So after many, many uh, trials, uh, the neural network actually can find a nice uh, metric uh, which have a nice overlap with the expected uh, lattice QCD data, like this. So after uh, 10,000 epochs of the training, uh, you find uh, this kind of metric function. And with this metric, uh, uh, if you compute the scalar equation of motion, then you have uh, these green uh, cross uh, result as an output, uh, which has a nice overlap with the true uh, lattice data. And interesting fact is that uh, this H of beta diverges at the possible location of horizon here. I didn't tell uh, this neural network uh, the boundary condition around the horizon. But somehow this uh, uh, neural network learns the location of horizon by itself. And that's why this H of beta diverges uh, around this horizon. So it's interesting. So anyway, uh, the machine learning finds uh, this weight distribution, which is interpreted as a metric. And also, uh, at the same time, I train the ADS radius and the scalar coupling constant. And this is the train uh, value of the potential and the ADS radius. So ADS radius is found to be almost equal to the QCD scale uh, as I expected. But, uh, well, 
So if, if you start with uh, nothing, then uh, it's difficult to find uh, this kind of value, which can fit the uh, QCD data very well. And also uh, four, uh, five, four coupling constant turned out to be slightly positive. Uh, that is also consistent uh, in as a holographic model. So this is how uh, we can find the emergent metric uh, from chiral condensate data. Another example uh, which I could show is the training by using meson spectrum. So uh, the previous example is about chiral condensate. But of course, uh, you can use uh, zero temperature data uh, like uh, spectrum. So for example, uh, this is a very famous uh, model by Katz, Katzson, and Stefanov about uh, raw meson spectrum. So uh, they started with a five-dimensional uh, Dilaton gravity background and put a vector, meson, vector boson in this five-dimensional background. And here, the unknown function as a background is the, uh, uh, this Dilaton and also the metric at zero temperature. So this warp factor A of Z is unknown. At the boundary Z is zero, uh, this combination phi minus A should behave as log of Z so that it becomes ADS. So this is the boundary condition. So what they did is as follows. So uh, for a given uh, metric background, for example, they, uh, uh, they use a very simple phi and A, like phi of Z is just Z squared and A of Z is log Z. So that's the easiest choice. And then you solve the equation of motion for the gauge field and decompose it as a, as a Kurzakline decomposition. And then you solve the normalizable equation like this. And then uh, you demand that this is normalizable uh, means uh, this omega squared needs to take a special discrete value, which is uh, m squared, where m is a uh, uh, meson mass. So this is how uh, meson spectra is calibrated in this five-dimensional model. So now I want to do uh, backwards. For given uh, experimental data of raw mesons, uh, can you find this B of Z backwards? That's the question. The strategy is almost the same. So first, uh, I, I, I use this uh, vector equation of motion, and then I make it to a Hamilton equation, then discretize the Z direction, and prepare a neural network representation for this, these equations. And then if input is the uh, data of uh, uh, meson mass, and then output is the uh, vector field is equal to zero at the infrared, uh, which is a normalizability condition, and that's it. So for the input, uh, you can borrow uh, particle data group data for raw meson mass, for example, the ground the lowest raw meson is this, and first excited raw meson is this. And of course, you can use uh, higher ones to make the prediction more uh, kind of uh, precise. So here, blue ones are positive and true data, and orange ones are false negative data. And using this as a uh, data, you can train the neural network and find uh, this kind of emergent metric. So here is a plot of uh, B prime Z, where Z is the horizontal direction, which is the um, uh, extra dimension. And around Z equals zero, if it is uh, ADS boundary, uh, it approaches the ADS, uh, pure ADS metric, but inside uh, it has a kind of some strange behavior. And once uh, this metric is assumed, then it reproduces uh, this uh, raw meson uh, data. 
Okay, so this ends the section two, uh, of which I could uh, use uh, in which I could use the machine learning to find out the mob metric. Do you have any question? Yes, I've got a question. Um, so, of course, now you applied uh, the lattice data or particle data um, to um, specific models, but mm -hmm. suppose. Um, you would now combine different lattice data sets from say different collaborations and so on. So mm -hmm. how would you make sure that uh, this machine learning algorithm really then understands that uh, it should only uh, basically, um, it, it should treat this data in a careful way in the sense that um, you cannot maybe uh, just uh, compare different data sets from different collaborations or so. That's right, yes. So of course, uh, uh, depending on what, uh, what data you use, the emergent metric would differ. So uh, for example, for this case, the, uh, I use just the particle data group data. And uh, uh, of course, uh, raw meson mass has the widths. So this is just a central value of it, but uh, it has a widths. So uh, and you can implement the widths uh, in holographic models, but here we just use uh, widths as the widths of this uh, positive data. This is not the uh, correct use of the widths, but uh, anyway, uh, we, we use it in that way. So uh, depending on uh, what kind of uh, holographic model you use, uh, actual uh, application of uh, the data deviation you know, would be different. So uh, I would say that, uh, yeah, so if you seek for a simple uh, holographic model, then it doesn't have uh, a large number of parameters. So uh, once it is fit by a single uh, data, then it would uh, disagree with other data. So uh, to make uh, things more precise, you need to broaden the parameter space of these uh, mod holographic models. Then I think uh, using various uh, lattice data uh, actually uh, uh, pin down what is the correct uh, holographic model. Mm. And, uh, that answers my question. Yeah, um, uh, follow up question. So could you give me a rough estimate? How how long did it take really to to learn uh, to um, basically like on a computer to get those uh, functions? Oh, prime of set or f and uh, h of set which you showed beforehand so just that i get a feeling how uh, expensive this is uh, computational time wise so uh in the uh, previous uh, movie i showed uh it's just like a one hour yeah but uh i should uh, so i need to try many many uh, different initial uh, uh initialization of the uh, weights so uh, if my initial condition for the weights before the training is a bad one, then uh, training doesn't proceed. So uh, yeah, so I need to uh, seek for a good initial condition for the weight space, uh, in the weight space. And uh, that actually takes some time. So in so total, next, one, yeah. Uh, so next question is by Rene. Yeah, hi. Um, so following up to what Martin was asking, so, Real QCD data is neither at infinite coupling nor at infinite n. Now, in order to ameliorate this problem, in principle, you could try to write down effective action to any higher order that you want, let's say for your scalar field, right? But uh, since this includes higher derivative terms, you might face the problem that you, you don't have uh, a simple two derivative equation anymore. Is this a problem? Have you tried to do this, like just to see what are the how constrained the higher derivative terms, for example, are? Um, no. So yeah, as you say, uh, so uh, for for example, in this case of uh, uh, raw meson mass, I use the experimental data, which is n c equal to three. So uh, it uh, should not be uh, reproduced by any holographic model if I truncate the uh, action at the three to the ball. Yeah, that's correct. Uh, however, uh, the purpose of finding a holographic model is uh, to, uh, to, to, to find out the, uh, uh, 
the reason why uh, QCD uh, gives you such a number, right? So it's not a very precise reproduction of uh, uh, real data. So uh, in that sense, I think uh, it's better to stop at the, the simplest uh, uh, holographic model rather than going to the uh, uh, more and more higher derivative terms to uh, actually fit the model better and better. So uh, yeah, our research is uh, still at that level and uh, not uh, really precise uh, kind of things. No, no, it, I don't. I didn't mean to criticize. I'm, I'm just. Asking. No, no, no. Yeah, I understand your question. <laughs> <laughs> because you see, as far as I understand, these neural networks can actually handle a lot of parameters, right? Like you can have functions functions fitted with 200 parameters, for example. Mm. So in principle, it should be possible to learn something about more complicated effective actions. Yes. Oh, that's right, that's right, yes. So that's a very good point. Um, so uh, here, uh, as I uh, emphasized, our neural network is a very sparse neural network, uh, which has a little number of uh, parameters. So if I allow, uh, for example, these are uh, all lines to take arbitrary values, then this uh, fits the data quite well. Yeah, it's possible. However, we lose uh, the uh, interpretation, right? Mm -hmm. So only when this sparse neural network is prepared, we can interpret this as a bulk metric and we have a physical understanding of that. So, uh, so that uh, actually corresponds to, uh, for example, adding higher derivative terms here. So uh, adding more lines and adding more parameters correspond to uh, make this uh, uh, equation more complicated. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So uh, I still uh, stick to this uh, very simple model because uh, this uh, allows uh, me to interpret this neural network. Okay, thanks. Thank you. So there's another question by Kevin. Hello. Yes. Hi. Hi, yes. Um, uh, uh, can I ask a question? You, you've shown two examples where you've um, tried to reconstruct the bulk geometry from two different types of observables. Mm -hmm. but what, what tends to happen if you try to combine different types of, not, not just different data sets for the same observable, but different observables in the, like if you're trying to come up with a theory which kind of at least describes both observables, do nice. you know what tends to happen then? Yes, yes. So we tried. Thank you for the question. So uh, for for this, uh, so so what I showed is the chiral condensate and the raw meson mass, mm -hmm. and those are for different temperature. The chiral condensate is normally at large QCD, which is at uh, non-zero temperature, but raw meson mass is at uh, zero temperature. So these two observables uh, should give different metrics since the temperature is different. So metric should be different, right? So uh, in these cases, uh, so you cannot combine these two. However, uh, for example, uh, if I stick to the zero temperature case, then you, need, you can prepare, for example, raw meson mass and other meson masses. And then uh, using these data, uh, you can actually fix uh, more parameters of the model. For example, okay. uh, in this raw meson case, uh, what you can fix is just this uh, B prime, uh, which is a combination of Dilaton and the metric. But if you uh, prepare the data for other uh, mesons which have different spins, then the uh, combination uh, uh, coefficient, a linear combination coefficient of these two is different for that model. So uh, using the training, you can independently uh, determine pi and z, az, right? So this has more predictive power uh, as a model. And is that guaranteed to be consistent if I just keep including more and more observables? So you've no. included, oh yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, so uh, so what, what I mean is that uh, if you add one other observable, then uh, maybe you need to add uh, one parameter to the model. Yeah, yeah. Okay, yeah. So that, uh, yeah, it, uh, it, it is consistent, yeah. Okay. Also, I, if I may ask another question about how, how you actually generate um, false data so in, 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 in my experience, uh, sort of, um, uh, <clears throat> uh, for example, adding noise to, to, no, uh, to image recognition uh, data, depending on the noise that you add and where you add it in the training, you can get very different outcomes. That's uh, right, yes. 
<laughs> you are right. So for example, uh, in this uh, Romezon case, uh, what I need to make sure is that uh, here there is no uh, uh, spectrum, right? Mm -hmm. So I put uh, many, many uh, negative data here so that I can actually debate uh, this bad situation. So, uh, so you need to actually uh, uh, cook up uh, some good uh, uh, post data. I see. Uh, to make, uh, okay. yeah, success. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. So uh, in the remaining 10 minutes or so, uh, let me talk about the action reconstruction. Here, I don't use machine learning. Uh, since we have the uh, metric, uh, what we need to do is to find out the action which uh, solves, uh, to, which has a solution uh, which is identical to this emergent uh, metric uh, given in section two. So this is the picture I showed earlier. And let me consider the left-hand side, which is bulk reconstruction. So in our case, uh, this is a picture. Uh, at the bottom, we have QCD. So meson spectrum I use, or chiral condensate I use for the final temperature. And independently, these give you the metric information like this. And from uh, so from each of these things, uh, in fact, I can determine the uh, bulk Einstein action with this dilaton potential. So normally, this dilaton potential uh, could be arbitrary. However, uh, if this uh, dilaton potential is chosen quite nicely, then it gives you uh, this B prime as a solution. So our next task is to determine this V of phi, which is the dilaton potential of this gravity action. Then once this action is determined, then you can uh, give some other prediction. And in, in our case, uh, we uh, compute the core potential as a simplest example. So a uh, brief review of uh, the previous section is that if I use row of meson spectrum, then I got uh, B prime Z, which is the uh, combination of dilaton and metric. And it was given by this shape of function. On the other hand, at finite temperature chiral condensate data, I got this H of eta, which is a combination of temporal part of the metric and the spatial part of the metric. And I got this shape. So let me use uh, B prime first. So you can actually solve uh, this uh, backwards. Uh, it's, mm, it's a bit involved, but you can do it, yes. Since this is a differential equation, it's an ordinary differential equation, you can integrate it once. Then a combination of Einstein equation and the other equation motion, it's a bit involved, but you can do it. Uh, from this uh, met, uh, explicit form of the metric, uh, you can reconstruct this V of phi numerically. Then this is the result. So V of phi as a function of dilaton phi. Uh, these blue uh, dots are the numerically obtained dilaton potential, uh, whose solution is this B prime Z. Uh, this dashed line uh, is uh, this function, uh, 12 times uh, hyperbolic cosine of this. Uh, blue dotted uh, line is uh, a little bit of uh, correction added to the first example. And each of these actually fit uh, this numerical data very well. And if you are uh, interested in this part, then this blue dotted uh, fitting is better. And what is interesting is that if I look back the uh, old paper by Gabza and Nello in 2008, they eventually considered this kind of dilaton potential. I don't know the reason. So they eventually considered this one. And our machine learning procedure rediscovered uh, this potential. So it's a nice coincidence. So I use this dilaton potential. And let me evaluate uh, also uh, this uh, exponential part 
So uh, look at this uh, axis. This is a log plot. So this uh, linear uh, looking uh, line is an exponential uh, function, which is hyperbolic cosine. And I fit uh, this part in the following way. So fitting function, I suppose uh, this time is this. This was uh, proposed uh, in improved holographic QCD model, uh, where P and Q are some numerical numbers. And this is the uh, fitting, uh, fitting result of our Dilaton potential uh, with different values of the Dilaton initial condition. So each of these uh, dots uh, uh, fits uh, well this uh, uh, large phi region. And uh, in, in particular, what is interesting is that uh, this part is very close to P is equal to one half and Q is equal to two thirds. Uh, what is interesting about these numbers is that, in fact, if you choose these numbers, then you can find that global uh, spectra uh, follows regular behavior. Uh, it was proven in improved holograph QCD. So this means that uh, our uh, Dilaton potential actually gives you uh, the global regular behavior. I don't know why, but somehow uh, it's working good. Okay, from this uh, gravity model, uh, at zero temperature, you have the metric. So uh, you can compute the uh, quark potential. The metric looks like this. Since Dilaton and uh, uh, metric is uh, a kind of uh, completely uh, nicely separated uh, by this action. So you can plot the metric itself rather than B prime. So here is uh, so uh, blue dots uh, is our uh, metric and red dots uh, is the Einstein frame metric. So let's consider string frame metric, uh, which is uh, nicely fitted around here region uh, by this function. If you compute the uh, uh, Wilson loop uh, from this uh, string frame metric, then the result looks like this. So the uh, horizontal axis is the quark distance, and the vertical distance is the quark potential. So it has a, a nice uh, linear potential. So it's confining. So that is interesting. So we started from uh, B prime, and that is the emergent metric uh, given by the Romeson mass. So Romeson mass only uh, determined this model completely and predicted this uh, linear potential of Wilson loop. So normally the uh, confinement actually relates the hadron picture. So these two uh, gives you uh, so. Uh, uh, our result of finding this Wilson loop linear potential out of the Romeson mass spectrum is a kind of a consistent big picture uh, of QCD. So what about the chiral condensate? So uh, on the other hand, uh, you remember that uh, we can uh, fix this metric uh, out of chiral condensate data. So normally chiral condensate is not related to confinement, right? So it's a kind of difficult issue in QCD, whether the, uh, uh, say, uh, chiral symmetry breaking is related to confinement or not. That's a difficult question. So here uh, I try that. Uh, from the chiral condensate data, we have this metric. And this metric component uh, actually determined uh, this uh, Dilaton potential backwards. So here is a result of the Dilaton potential. Uh, this red line or green, green line. So these are the Dilaton potential. Now, trial number one and number two uh, says that uh, I tried uh, machine learning twice, and these uh, look uh, quite similar to each other. But this is uh, the Dilaton potential uh, uh, determined from this kind of condensate. And by using Dil this Dilaton potential, I, I can compute the Wilson loop again. And here is the result. So vertical axis is the quark, uh, anti-quark distance. The vertical axis is the uh, uh, quark potential. And red dots are our computed result. And this red line 
is the uh, device screening, uh, which is uh, which is happening because of this is a uh, finite temperature. And gray dots are uh, lattice data uh, uh, by Petritsky in 2010. So you look at the data, lattice data of uh, 200 MeV, which is this triangle. So it's here. So as you can see, our result actually uh, nicely overlaps uh, with lattice data. In particular, the uh, stream breaking distance, which is about 0 0.6 femtometer, uh, matches quite well with the lattice data. This is amazing. Uh, I didn't expect uh, uh, that kind of uh, nice matching. Since we started just with the chiral condensate lattice QCD data, which uh, normally uh, tells us nothing about the confinement, right? But here, uh, through this uh, uh, process, uh, our prediction actually matches uh, lattice QCD data quite well. So I think this is the uh, success of uh, bulk reconstruction technique, uh, which we uh, implemented with the help of uh, deep learning. And uh, this is a good way to find a gravity model. So here is a conclusion. So I uh, explained what is the difficulty in finding a holographic model uh, that is a bulk reconstruction. So there are several bulk reconstruction techniques, but here I use the, the similarity between neural network and uh, ADS-CFT. And then with the help of that, uh, I could fix and determine the gravity metric uh, from which you can do many predictions. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you much for your nice talk. So are there any questions? So maybe, uh, yeah, so there's a question by Carlo. Yes, please. Yeah, hi, thank you for the nice talk. Um, I was somewhat puzzled by the curve you showed, this red curve in the previous slide. Uh -huh. um, because we used similar put, uh, dilaton potentials and usually it's, we found it extremely hard to get a curve or a potential that goes above zero. So uh -huh. I'm surprised uh -huh. by this curve. Uh, you mean this uh, uh, Wilson loop curve? Yes. Uh, so, uh, so uh, if you mean uh, uh, this line by uh, zero, then that's, so. So, you so, so it. Um, yeah. So this this zero is the uh, a kind of uh, mm -hmm. so so you can actually shift zero uh, by arbitrary constant yeah. since. Uh, Wilson loop computation in ADS actually uh, is, uh, has an infinite constant term. So we need to subtract that. Right? So uh, in our case, uh, 200 uh, MeV uh, result uh, actually uh, gives uh, this part as a zero. And I shifted uh, this uh, so that uh, it fits the lattice uh, data of uh, 270 MeV. But 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 even then, even with this shift, we we never found. Ah, hang on. But but how do you calculate it? How do you subtract the the uh, infinity? Um. So that's a so so that's a comparison uh, between the hang uh, string and two parallel string, which is stuck to the black hole horizon. Ah. Oh, but that you shouldn't do. But that is that that you should not do. Why? Uh, then that? you can probably improve your your agreement with the data a lot, because that that uh, that is not the potential. That gives you the binding energy. You should subtract only the uh, infinite term or, or constant in addition, only the UV infinite term. Oh, I see. I see. What you mean is that uh, in fact you can you you have a way to fix the zero. Um, That's what you mean, right? Yeah, but the subtraction of two hanging strings. I, I, it was done in the original papers, but it is actually wrong. 
to get the potential, you have to subtract only the UV infinity plus maybe a constant. But you should not subtract something temperature dependent, which you do if you have oh, a hanging sense. string. Then the lower end gives you, I mean, you have an integral and that gives you a T, T dependence. And that is uh, also in heavy quark theory, well known that uh, this gives you a wrong result. Sure, sure, sure. Actually, yeah. this, if you plot this at different temperatures, and you really I assume you subtract the, the full, full hanging strings, then actually mm -hmm. this increases with temperature rather than decrease as it should. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So if you subtract I, only the UV infinity, then probably that agreement with data is even much better. I see. I, I is, then, and then this becomes a very steep curve that I remember indeed, yeah. So if you mm -hmm. do this, this binding energy, that is very steep and goes above zero. Oh yeah, that explains why. Yeah. yeah. Mm? I see. I see. So so yeah. So what I did is uh, just a, a single value of the temperature, which is two hundred and seventy. Yeah, so, but if you, if you look at the temperature dependence, it should uh, this should go yeah. up instead. Like the lattice data, of course, go down, and mm -hmm. and this subtraction of two two hanging uh, hanging strings uh, actually goes up with temperature. So the wrong. I see. I see. So uh, yeah, so let me calculate uh, that uh, since the uh, gravity action is already determined. So uh, yeah, 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 you can easily do it, of course. Yeah, thank that you very much. Thank you. So are there further questions? Uh, Martin, can I ask a question? Yes, please go ahead. Okay. Hello, could you? Thanks for the very interesting talk. Uh, uh, as far as I figured out from the first part of your talk, mm -hmm. I think uh, for the system to learn a nonlinear, a, a specific nonlinear dynamics, mm -hmm. one one important characteristic is to to, to it is this uh, activation function. Mm -hmm. Then I didn't understand I didn't understand how you determine these nonlinear activation functions. In your examples, in particular, when you try to construct the bulk and how the final result is sensitive to this uh, determination. I see. Uh, thank you for the question. Yes, I omit the explanation about the uh, uh, activation function here. So uh, in this uh, Hamilton form of the equation, uh, here uh, you have the potential term. So if I start with phi four theory, then this is phi to the cube, right? And that is the nonlinear part. So in on the other hand, in the neural network, uh, activation function is completely fixed, and you don't optimize normally. In, in our examples, uh, we also optimize the coefficient of this nonlinear term. Okay. So since a uh, scalar a uh, scalar uh, Scalar field theory uh, includes phi four uh, term, uh, which has a coupling constant, which is unknown. So I also need to optimize this part. And so in the activation function uh, here, uh, I have coupling constant lambda, which is also optimized. Yeah, so I have a very special uh, activation function in this neural network. Normally in uh, machine learning, you don't optimize the coefficient of the uh, activation function. But here I optimize it. Then uh, you can determine the coupling constant. Um, uh, I, I would like to know if, for example, let's assume that I don't know anything about holography and ADS CFD. Just mm -hmm. I would like to follow your procedure. Is it mm -hmm. easy for me to guess such function? Um, uh i think no so uh if i use the ordinary neural network then activation mm -hmm. function is uh fixed it's, it could be sigmoid or it could be a uh, relu so it's already given the yeah package I see. I see. And if i use that then it uh, yeah it corresponds to a very strange uh field theory uh, in holography mm -hmm. but you can optimize it yeah <laughs> okay okay thank you very much Welcome. So are there further questions?
So uh, let me ask one. Um, so yes. we already had some talks uh, which also discussed that, of course, uh, neutron star mergers and so on are also a possibility uh, to constrain uh, basically um, the QCD uh, thermodynamics uh, transport coefficients. Um, so do you think in, in future you can combine not only QCD lattice data, but also with such uh, astrophysical data and uh, get a consistent, um, consistent holographic model? Yes, sure. Yes. Uh, the reason is quite simple. Since uh, we have uh, uh, already a big knowledge about uh, the ADS safety dictionary, and uh, depending on what kind of bulk uh, fields, uh, 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 you have the dictionary and you have the corresponding uh, physical observables in QCD. For example, in this uh, uh, QGP experiment, you have the viscosity, right? And viscosity comes from the energy momentum tensor that corresponds to the gravity fluctuation in the metric. And gravity fluctuation is nothing but uh, this kind of equation with unknown background. So viscosity data can be uh, uh, implemented in a very similar way uh, using this uh, ADS deep learning. And uh, in fact, there is one paper which uh, treats uh, viscosity uh, in this deep learning manner. So once a detailed uh, uh, correlator of uh, uh, this uh, uh, Kubo formula in uh, fluid in QGP is obtained, then you can use uh, this uh, technique to reconstruct the bulk geometry. So that's one example. So depending on what kind of observables you, you, you get uh, in that QCD or experiments, uh, I think uh, it's uh, kind of uh, straightforward and easy to implement this ADS deep learning and find the gravity metric out of data. Okay, thank you. I don't see any raised hands anymore. So there seem to be no further questions. We already had a few during the talk. So again, thank you much for your nice talk. And now thank I you. stop recording so people can stay around and ask questions outside uh, the official part. Thank you very much.